After nearly nine years of combat in Iraq, all U.S. troops are scheduled to withdraw by the end of the year. But the U.S. presence and influence will continue. Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki is in Washington this week to lay out what shape post-war relations between the two countries will take. And despite repeated promises of friendship and support from both sides, disagreements over detainees, legal immunity, and diplomacy with neighboring nations may complicate the partnership in the months and years ahead. FSRN's Alice Olstein has the story from Washington. The U.S. wanted Iraq to give troops staying in the country beyond 2011 immunity from prosecution. But after the Iraqi government refused, President Obama announced a full withdrawal of all military personnel by the end of the year. He repeated that pledge at a Monday press conference with Iraq's prime minister. Our war in Iraq ends this month. NATO Secretary General Anders Fogh Rasmussen made a similar announcement Monday morning. NATO has decided to withdraw the training mission from Iraq by the 31st of December this year when the current mandate of the mission expires. Agreement on the extension of this successful program did not prove possible despite robust negotiations over several weeks. Both U.S. and NATO troops had originally planned on maintaining a reduced presence in Iraq in a training capacity. We've got an enormous investment uh, of blood and treasure uh, in Iraq, and and we want to make sure that uh, even as we bring the last troops out, that it's it's well understood both in Iraq and here in the United States that our commitment to Iraq's success is going to be enduring. Although the leaders gave few concrete details of what that commitment will look like, it will certainly include a mix of both diplomats and private contractors. The State Department estimated in May that between 4,500 and 5,000 security contractors will remain in Iraq to guard the thousands of diplomatic personnel at the embassy in Baghdad and around the country. And running the embassy will cost $3.8 billion in 2012 alone. President Obama defended this heavy footprint at the joint conference. I think the Iraqi people can understand that uh, as president of the United States, if I'm putting uh, civilians in the field in order to help the Iraqi people uh, build their economy uh, and improve their productivity, I want to make sure that uh, they come home because they are not soldiers. Uh, So that... Uh, makes the numbers larger than they otherwise would be, but the overall mission that they're carrying out is comparable to the missions that are taking place in other countries that are big, that are important, uh, and that are friends of ours. Human rights groups both here and in Iraq are wary of an increased use in private security forces, with memories of abuse by companies such as Blackwater still fresh. The corporation, whose contract was revoked after a 2007 attack that killed more than a dozen civilians, has since changed its name twice, first to XE, then to Academy. Its new CEO, Ted Wright, told the Wall Street Journal that they've hired an outside company to help them apply for a new operating license in post-war Iraq. Robert Neyman of Just Foreign Policy says there's plenty to be concerned about with private security forces, but there are some new mechanisms in place for increased accountability. If you look at the you know, most notorious shooting incidents, a lot of the anger in Iraq was not just about the killings and what happened, but it was the fact that there was no clear path to holding these people accountable, either in U.S. law or in Iraqi law. And at least on paper, that is going to change. The State Department confirmed in October that private contractors in Iraq will not have immunity from Iraqi criminal jurisdiction. An issue not mentioned in the joint press conference was the fate of Ali Musa Dakduk, the last U.S. detainee in Iraq, who was accused of being a Hezbollah operative who helped orchestrate a raid in 2007 that killed American soldiers. The administration has not yet announced whether it will turn him over to the Iraqi government, as it's mandated to do, or try to take him out of the country for a military or civilian trial. Because the evidence against Dakduk was obtained through torture, an Iraqi court may acquit him, as they have other former U.S. prisoners. Naaman says this and other points of contention reveal a failure on the part of the U.S. to make Iraq fall in line with our global interests. The expectation in the U.S. Uh, has been that we created this government. It should do what we want. It should do what we say. And if you look across a range of issues, like the control of Iraqi oil, the relationship with Iran, position on Bahrain, Syria, 
Lebanon, Israel-Palestine conflict, the Iraqi government is not a mere puppet of the United States. Yet al-Maliki's remarks at the joint press conference suggest that his government may serve U.S. economic interests in the years to come. Iraq today has a lot of wealth and needs experience and expertise and American and, and foreign uh, uh, expertise to help Iraq uh, exploiting its own wealth. Uh, and we hope that the American uh, companies will have the largest role in uh, increasing our uh, wealth uh, in the area of oil and other aspects as well. Prime Minister al-Maliki also joined President Obama for a wreath-laying ceremony at Arlington Cemetery on Monday to honor the nearly 4,500 Americans killed in Iraq. Conservative estimates put the number of Iraqi civilians killed at more than 100,000. Alice Olstein, FSRN, Washington.